Things change for a reason. Uh, this morning I was going to preach in Matthew chapter 3 on the exact same thing that John Tinkle preached on, walking on water, but uh, he beat me to it. He did a good job, so I had to change my message. I was leaning towards a message that I, I titled, Are There Any More John the Baptist Left? And uh, I, I don't take uh, the chances to preach lightly. Uh, I really tried to think of something that would be an encouragement to you guys, and and John beat me to the punch this morning with uh, preaching out of uh, Matthew chapter 3. And, and, but this really spoke volumes to me. And I think this is what we really need in our country. And that is bold, spirit-filled, God-honoring preachers that will stand behind the, God, the word and stick to the stuff. You know, a lot of times today it seems like everybody's compromising the please man. Everybody's compromising and... and, and not standing behind God's word. And I just admire John the Baptist. So I want to dive in and look at some of the things that made John the Baptist such a spirit-filled and, and dedicated preacher. So if you would, turn with me over to John chapter 1, and we'll start to look uh, at some things. First thing is John was set apart. He was set apart first by call. On uh, John chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we see the call. It says there, this, there was a man sent from God those, whose name was John. The same came for the witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. You know what? He was called by God. Can I tell you something? If you're called by God, John the Baptist was called by God to be a, a witness. But if you're called by God, you're never going to be satisfied unless you're doing God's work. You know, I work with uh, Brother Perry at the ice cream factory, and, and I'm thankful for a job. God has blessed me with a job, and it, it makes it where I can make it in the church all the time. It is an added blessing. But can I tell you, I'm, I'm more happy when I'm doing God's work, when we're out door knocking, when we're out uh, visiting people, when we're visiting people in the nursing homes. And, and I'd much rather do that than make ice cream. You know, ice cream's sweet. Uh, my, sis, my daughter would say I need to eat more ice cream so I get sweeter. She's really praying that I don't go on a too big of a tirade on, on preaching tonight. But, you know, uh, John the Baptist, he was called. And, and you know what? If you're sitting here today and you're called to preach or be a missionary or be a van, uh, work on the van road or be a Sunday school teacher, you're never going to be satisfied until you step out in faith. Kind of like John Tinkle has stepped out in faith to be a missionary to the Dominican Republic. Number two, he knew his duty. You can see it right here in uh, verses 15 through 17. And it said this, John bared witness of him and cried, saying, This has he whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is prepared before me, for he was before me, and of his fullness have all we received and, gr uh, and grace for grace. You know what? He, he, he knows what his job is. His job is to proclaim Christ. He, he isn't mixing what his job is. He, he knows what his job is. You know, sadly today we have a bunch of pastors that uh, are more into promoting events, trying to, to be, bring in big crowds rather than just tell the truth. You know, it was the truth when a preacher told the truth and spoke the Bible truth is that convicted my heart that I was a sinner. You know, up till age 18, I didn't know I was a sinner. I believed that there was a God. I believed God was good. I believed that I was a good enough person. But it wasn't until somebody read Proverbs chapter 16 and they started saying things that the Lord does hate. And I'm sitting there at age 18, I feel in the gut. I'm like, God doesn't like the life I'm living. You know what? It wasn't until a preacher had the boldness to preach God's word until I realized I was a sinner. It wasn't until somebody preached God's word that I realized that I needed to ask God and ask Jesus in my heart. Can I tell you something? Preaching God's word is always a remedy. Pleasing man is not. We got so many people looking at Congress. They're looking at, at, at people for legislation to make things better for them. But can I tell you something? Unless they find it in God's word, it ain't going to work. There's some temporary band-aids that we can put on things. It, it seems good for a season, but it won't last. You know, if you want something lasting, it'll be in this, word, in this book. It'll be in his word. Can I tell you something? I struggle with dyslexia. Nobody at work knows this. I really don't try to open this up. I do a little bit in preaching. But this was the last thing I thought I'd do when I got saved. The last thing. Because I really don't have any confidence in my reading skills. We sit there and uh, we joke around at work and we're doing the formulas. But I'm nervous every time I have to read something. 
because my mind sometimes switches things. Uh, inventory is a nightmare for me. If, if you're watching on YouTube and, and you're from work, you kind of now understand why we get some things switched around. It's, it's, it's that dyslexia. And can I tell you something? There's nothing greater than just submitting to God. You know, God has blessed me with, with uh, three children, a great wife, and, you know, I've never had to worry about a thing. Just be obedient. You know, the world would say, go strike out and go do what you want. Go do what pleases you. Can I tell you something? Before I surrendered to preach, I did a lot of things I wanted to. Uh, I was saved. I helped out in church, but I was never satisfied. Uh, I, I'd go all over and go fishing. Uh, I've trout fished in Colorado, Montana, Idaho. Uh, did a lot of fly fishing. And you know what? Never was satisfied. At, by the time that uh, I made the decision to... Uh, become a pastor, and when God put it on my heart, and I was fighting it, I got a promotion. I was the youngest person on day shift, making over $20 an hour, uh, had a boat, had a daughter, had a good wife, had money in the bank, and I still wasn't happy. You want to know why I wasn't happy? Because I wasn't doing God's will. You know what John the Baptist did? He knew happiness was in doing God's will. You want happiness in your life? Do God's will. You know, the best place to do God's will is submitting to him and getting to the altar and just confessing it to God. You know, one of the things John Tinkle I know very well, going to the Dominican, is he's pursuing God's will. If our pastor today said, John Tinkle, you can be the pastor here, he wouldn't be satisfied here. He's called the Dominican. You know, if you're called to do something, if you're called by God, you're only going to be satisfied unless you're doing his will. So he was set apart. He was set apart in his call. He knew his duty. Another thing is he was set apart by his location. Look at Matthew chapter uh, 3 verse 1, Matthew chapter 3 verse 1, and uh, you know, one thing that we tend to miss out in this busy, busy life that we have is setting apart time. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, in the wilderness. God already set him apart. He had his time in the wilderness. That time leading up to him preaching, he had alone time with God. You know, there's a por there is an importance in alone time with God. Can I tell you something? I start out my day every day finding some devotions to send out to some men and read God's word and think about seven or eight people to pray for each and every day before I get up and go to work. Can I tell you, that calms me. That calms me a lot. But I get more out of doing that than I do just trying to read through the Bible in a year. Because I'm searching God for, for answers. And can I tell you something? In, in that alone time, it was important for John the Baptist, but it's also important for us because when we get alone, we have a set time. We have a plan. You know, uh, I love my wife, and when we first started courting and getting to know each other, you know, I wanted to spend as much time as I could because I wanted to get to know her. When we love the Lord, we want to spend as much time with him as we can. You know, sadly, we have the Bible readily available. I can pull out a cell phone. I can listen to it at work. I can listen to podcasts. I can listen to the Bible. I can listen to the good Bible preaching. But it seems like the Bible has gone on deaf ears in this nation. It seems like more and more people have turned away from God's word when it's the most readily available. You need that alone time. We don't emphasize the alone time. You know, uh, today I told my wife, I go, take our son and go, go out and do lunch. They had a lunch date. You know, it, some of the most important time we have with anybody is our alone time. You, wanna, you know how to spell love? Everybody says it's L-O-V. You know what love, how love is spelled? It's time, T-I-M-E, time. Time is love. You want to see love for Christ? Have time for Christ. You want him to work in your life? Give him time. Can I tell you something? The other thing, when we have alone time, we get a hold of him. Can I tell you something? I, I had four messages lined up for today. I really wanted to preach that one that John Tinkle preached. I, I don't know how we were on the same, same wavelength, but I wanted that message. And, uh, but can I tell you something? He, he kept going back to this message. And, and it, I could have preached some that were easy. I could preach some that would have been uh, uplifting, but God directed to this message. When you get a hold of God, God will direct you. And if you don't understand that, I'll just explain it like this. He'll make it where there's no other decision. When you start spending time with God, and, and I really wanted to preach that message, John Tinkle had the message. So now that's gone. We ain't doing that one. So what's our, uh, what's our option? Follow what God wanted. God wanted me to preach this message tonight. Get in tune. When you're alone and you get a hold of God, you get in tune with God. Can I tell you something? If things aren't going right in life, if you're starting to seem like things are off, Spend more time with God. Get in tune with him. You know, sometimes we, we make a decision and we think we know God's 
will because we think we know the Bible well. Well, but can I tell you something? Sometimes getting in tune means slowing down, just letting him have his way. I never, ever pictured after Bible college I'd be in Searcy, Arkansas, spending time with Pastor Brooks. Can I tell you that's been the best, best thing for me and my family? Can I tell you another thing? My pride wanted to be anywhere but not serving. I wanted to be a head pastor. I wanted to do things my way. God said, no, sit back, stay in Searcy, go under Brooks. Don't, uh, at the time, I didn't get it. It's going to be the best thing for your family. Can I tell you something? Family is first, first and foremost. Can I tell you something? I've seen great improvements in the attitude of my daughter. I've seen more family time. I've seen my wife grow spiritually. And you know what? It's because I got in tune with God. Not in tune with my intentions, but in tune with God's intentions. You know what? John the Baptist was in tune with God. He never questioned his walk. Why? Because he was in tune with God. He knew God's word. He knew what God's desires was. Can I tell you something else? We, we think about his bold preaching. If you look at verses 2 and 3 in chapter 3, we, we start to see it. He says, and he says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Elias, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. You know what? He, 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 he knew what he had to do. He had boldness because he spent time with God so he could proclaim it. You know, you don't have boldness for God because you don't spend time with God so you can't proclaim what God says. You know what? I can proclaim what God says because I spent time with him. I can have boldness because I spent time with him. But can I tell you something? If I back off and I don't spend time with him, my soul winning stinks. You know, I, my heart is not in it. You know, if I, if I don't spend time with him, I can't preach a message. Everything is tapped into your relationship with God. You know, uh, John the Baptist, he was keyed in. These words that he used, repentance, was words that were not liked back then, and they're not liked right now. Can I tell you something? Nobody likes being told what you're doing is wrong. Can I tell you, we all have desires to go against the Bible. We just need to choose which one we're going to follow. Can I tell you, many today go after the fleshly desires, and we see a lot of broken homes because we chased after Females we weren't supposed to. We chased after jobs we shouldn't have. Can I tell you something? Here's one that worries me in going into the ministry. We chased after positions that were not yours. Can I tell you something? The biggest thing Pastor Files taught me, the biggest thing, was family is your number one ministry. Can I tell you something? Your pastor says the same thing here. Family's number one ministry. If I could say, if I could go down this road and preach the gospel, knock doors, and see five people saved, but that one back there doesn't know the Christ, I failed. God gave me a mission field. It's my house. God gave John a mission field, and it was to go spread the gospel, go proclaim God, uh, J Jesus. And, you know, sadly, a lot of times we don't have boldness because we don't spend time with him. Uh, we see this too. He preached repentance to God, and it was unpopular. But when it was unpopular, he didn't back down. Can I tell you something? We live in a time where unity seems to be trumping biblical backing. Uh, we have people today that are in leadership that much rather turn a blind eye to sin and say, "I'm okay with that as long as we're united." You know what? The Bible says that's hogwash. You know. We're sitting here, and, and if the Bible says it's sin, it's sin. Adultery is sin. Homosexuality, homosexuality is sin. You know, I'm not trying to beat on anybody. Jesus came for all sinners to come to repentance. But can I tell you something? It does you no good to say sin's not sin. If you came up to me, brother Paul, and you were missing an eye, and I said, oh, you're fine, I'd be lying to you. I mean, you're not fine. You're missing an eye. If I, if, if I tell you that blatant sin is okay... I'm lying to you. We need more pastors that will stand behind the word. Stephen himself was a man that proclaimed the gospel, and, and, you know, he died. He was stoned. It was unpopular. But many people got saved because of his preaching. We look at the Bible, and, and, and we, we get the idea that, uh, that truth in preaching is the number one thing that needs to be done. Can I tell you something? We all have a job to do. Ezekiel talks about a watchman. A watchman. We'll turn over to Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. 
And can I tell you something? We just had winter storm warnings and watches, and people took that warning seriously. Walmart was filled with people, but sadly, we have a, a call on us to warn people, warn people about, about sin. And, and sadly, it seems like we aren't picking up the ball and running with it like we're supposed to. Verses uh, 17 and 19, we see this. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the words at, at my mouth and give them warning from me. Warning from me. Warning from God. You know, we're supposed to warn people that there is a sinner's hell. We need to warn people of the wickedness of sin. When It says this in 18. When I say unto you, the wicked, there shall surely die, and thou giveth him not warning, nor speak to warn the wickedness from his wicked ways to save his life, the same wicked man shall die his iniquity, but his blood will not will I require at thy hand. That's our warning. That's our warning. We're supposed to warn them. The pastor is, that comes up here and preaches, he preaches on sin, not because he's trying to belt on people and make people feel bad. He's trying to warn them. You know, I wonder how many times people have sat here, got angry at the pastor, rather than just say, that's God's word and I'm wrong. Can I tell you? Uh, I know that there's been times in my life where I've been hard-headed and I did not want to hear what the man of God was preaching. And he's preaching the Bible. And when I ran from it and I fought from it, I just got myself in bigger and bigger and bigger holes. Can I tell you something? If you ask my wife, you know, this is probably the kindest, most mild manner I've seasoned I've been in in quite some time. And, and, and my, if I'm going to be honest, I'm a little, at times I can be a little hot-headed. Brother Perry, you, we've been at work I try to do whatever I can to everybody to treat them with respect and try to give them grace. And, and, and sometimes I get treated like a doormat for it. You know, we're supposed to love our enemies as ourselves and, and, and just love on them. You know, it, it gets hard during a work week dealing with people that just don't like you, treat you like garbage. We need to love them anyway. We need to be a light to them anyway. We need to warn them anyway. We need to pray for them anyway. We need to be encouragement anyway. Can I tell you, it's not easy, but it's really not easy if you're not in God's word. Can I tell you something? I look at, I look at every week as a clean slate, and I look at some of these people, and I just pray day by day. I go, it might not be this week. It might not be the next week. It might, might not be this month. It might not be next month. But I sure pray at least they know what I stand for is true because I'm living true. Can I tell you, it is my job to win anybody, but it is my job to represent Christ. Christ is the winning. All we do is, is the leading. Look at this here. It says this in uh, verse 19. Uh, it, says, it says this. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquities, but thou hast delivered thy soul. You did your part. You know, my part is the... Stay true to warn. You know, my job is not to proclaim. It's not to beat down. It's not to, to be a problem. But, you know, if somebody asks a question and it's not biblical, I need to give a biblical answer, even if it hurts their feelings. You know, we can be truthful and not be hurtful. Yeah. Yep. That, that's something that we have done terrible, if we're honest. We, we tend to stand on our high horse of the Bible, but yet we aren't lenient to people. You know, last time I checked, I was a sinner going to sinner's hell, but I was saved by grace. I pray that these people get grace. I pray that they get to see the Lord. And I pray that they get an opportunity to grow. So many times we cut people down before they get a chance to grow. Can I tell you, I'm thankful that, one, I got saved. But, two, there was godly men and women that took some time and trained me. That took some time and encouraged me. And didn't say, hey, hey, it's time for you to grow up and just follow that book. I, I don't know it. When you get saved and you don't know it. You know, you don't know some of these things. You know, you got to have some lenience. You know, proclaim the truth, but be, be gracious, be merciful. Can I tell you something? One of my favorite things about living in, in Wisconsin is, is agricultural. You see corn and you see apple trees. And many times when we uh, look at agriculture, they, they, they go to harvest at different times. Man, it'd be really un, unsmart, it'd be unwise for the man that plants apple trees to think he should have a harvest when that corn comes up. Why? They, they, they come to maturity at different times. It's really foolish for us to 
not give grace and expect somebody that gets saved to be plugged in, know this word, and, and, and think that they're going to be at harvest at the same time as somebody else. We all grow at different rates. We need to be patient with people. We need to pray for them. We need to encourage them. We need to speak truth to them. But we need, we need to be gracious to them. Can I tell you something? The warning for that snow was, was being gracious to us, to prepare us for a chance of a storm that was coming. And, and, and we're thankful that, I'm thankful that it wasn't. I left Wisconsin because I hate snow and I hate the cold weather. So <laughs> every time we go in that freezer, Perry, I, I think, man, I'm glad I'm in Arkansas. But uh, uh, if, if we're honest, you know, we don't mind that warning. Why is it that it's so hard for us to warn people? You know, I, I think about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. We're going to flip over there real quick. The rich man and Lazarus, and that is in Luke, Luke chapter 16. And, and you know, I'm, I'm saying this, and I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but I'm trying to say something, is, you know, we play, we're Christians, we kind of practice male practice. You know, if we had a doctor that wasn't up to par, we would we'd say, man, he, he, he failed. He, he, he has male practice. He didn't do his job. Well, as Christians, and especially as preachers, we have a duty. And that duty is to proclaim the gospel and make sure that people have a general opportunity to get saved. So we look here at, uh, at the rich man and Lazarus in chapter 16, verses 28. And uh, we look at this, and we'll start in 22 and 23. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels unto Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes and began beg, being in torment and seeing Abraham afar uh, off and Lazarus in his bosom. Two different places, two different men, two different people got warnings. Now, I know the rich man got the warning because he knew who Abraham was. Can I tell you something? He still needed the warning. We see in 28, 28 through 31, we see, we see his plea. Can I, see, can I just show you this? For I have five brothers that he, he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. You know what? There's people waking up in hell today that have family members that don't want to be there. This rich man does not want his brothers to go there. Uh, we see this. And Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Hey, he's saying, hey, they have people. They have people. They had Moses. They had the prophets. Let them hear them. You know what? We have Christians. We have pastors. We have evangelists. They, they're, they're who they have. We need to proclaim the gospel. And then we go down a little bit more, and it says this. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would re repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they persuade those that have rose from the dead. Hey, the warning is to, pro is to proclaim the gospel. The warning is to keep people from a sinner in But The warning is so people don't have to go through tor torment. Can I tell you something? It says the heavens rejoice when a sinner gets saved. And, and man, we should be rejoicing when anybody comes through that door and they hear the gospel and they come to a saving knowledge of Christ. But can I tell you, we should be, we should be very, very weary going through this town, 22,000 people, 18 square miles there's a lot of people that need to hear the gospel. We have a pastor that represents the Bible. He encourages us to share the gospel, to give invitations, to, to invite them out to church so he can preach the gospel so they have a chance to, to get saved. Can I tell you something? One thing I know about John was John was never weary about his travel. He didn't let up. He wasn't slack in what he did. Uh, it says in Matthew, if we go back, Matthew, it said that he, he traveled... Let me get to the verse real quick. Flip over to Matthew chapter 3. And it said this. In chapter 3, verse 3, it said this. Uh, it said, oh, no, not 3. Okay, verse 5. And then he went out to him, Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and all the region and about Jordan, and were baptizing in the name of the Jordan, confessing their sins. You know what? He traveled. He didn't limit himself to okay, I, I, did, I was sufficient with my little area. Can I tell you something? There's a huge mission field here in Arkansas. You know, Pangburn needs to hear the gospel. Jasonia needs to hear the gospel. You know, uh, Searcy has areas that need to hear the gospel. We knocked on some doors a couple weeks ago just over on the other side, and there were some people that, that 
said that they would, wouldn't mind coming out to church. They had no church home. Me and Derek were talk, uh, talking to them. You know how many streets that is? The, how many streets we knocked was only two. There's a big, big world out there that needs to be reached. Can I tell you something else? John, when he traveled, he traveled from Jerusalem to Judea. Uh, Judea. And uh, when we look at that, it's estimated it was 70 miles. See, they didn't have convenience of cars. He didn't have convenience of, of what we have. He walked 70 miles proclaiming the gospel. Can I tell you, two blocks, two roads is pretty pathetic on my part. Can I tell you something else? I can't reach all of this area. Your pastor can't reach all this area. But if we have a desire for the people here, we should be able to take these tracts, these Bible tracts, and hand them out. We should be able to tell, tell our, our people that we work with, hey, we got a good church here. Why don't you come out? Hey, we have a missionary coming in like we did this morning, and he's from the Dominican. Let, us, let him share his experience. Hey, here's a fun little thing. You know, your cell phones, most of you guys have Facebook. Facebook. Go in there, plug in on Facebook, click, click on the talk part, put in uh, your location, and share that you're at church. Share that you're coming to hear God's word. Get it out there so people see our church. Get it out there that, that people start talking and ask questions. Maybe that will be your way of witnessing. Maybe you aren't as forward in, in knocking on doors. Maybe this, this passing out tracts isn't really your thing. Hey, I, I'm all for it, but there's somehow you can give out the gospel. Somehow. I mean, mail the things. There's somebody that will read it. You know, God, the value of a soul is so precious that Jesus was going to die for it. Why does it seem like it's not so precious to us? John, it was precious to him. He was willing to travel tons and tons of miles. Can I tell you something else? John was not concerned about being popular. Look at verse 7. He says this. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptisms, he said unto them, O oh, ye generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Can I tell you something? He knew who the Sadducees and the Pharisees were. Can I tell you something? He was denouncing them. He was saying, hey, you made a mockery. You had your religion. Can, can I tell you something? But he still had concern for them. He knew, he knew that they needed to hear the gospel, but he wanted to give them a little wake up. What, what you doing? You know, there's people in churches here that are playing religion. They're playing religion, and they think they're going to heaven. You know, I'm all for anybody that's saved that goes to another church. Amen, they're a brother or sister in Christ. But I'm concerned that we have many that play church, and they think they're going to heaven because they go to church and they're a good person. I don't know about you, but my Bible says that's not what salvation is. Salvation is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, we should be happy when we see people that are in other churches that are plugged in, that are saved. And, man, I'm happy to see people that do that when we're out knocking. That, that is hope to me. But can I tell you something? I, I'm I get very discouraged when I see people that have families and they're in church. And you, you ask them, you know, if they're sure they're going to heaven. Well, I've been baptized. Well, baptism doesn't save you. Mark 16, 16 says, believe and be baptized and thou shalt save. Those that believe not are damned. You know, that wasn't the baptism that damned you. It was the belief. Uh, can I tell you something? What, what pain could it be to, to get to the point of death, get there and realize you wake up in a sinner's hell because you didn't follow the Bible, but you follow a religion? I, you know, I... I I, I just, I don't get how these guys preach. I don't get how they can preach gospel, say that they preach the gospel, but yet they don't give the gospel. I don't get how people can say that they, they're pastors and not have concern for souls. Uh, can, can I tell you something? I, I was told by somebody, they're like, oh, preachers make good money. I go, not Bible-believing preachers. <laughs> you look at the attendance tonight. There ain't many people here. And, and you know what? I'm thankful that you guys are, but... There is a lot of people that think that it's a Sunday job and it's all gravy and 50, 60,000. Not if they're Bible-believing ones. If they're Bible-believing ones, they're often working another job. They're, they're working in the community. They're, they, they aren't trying to, it ain't about them, it's about everybody out there. You know what? Our pastor spends plenty of time visiting those that are shut in. Our pastor spends pr plenty of time at hospital beds and being with families, and it's because souls are precious. Souls are precious. 
And, and you know what? John the Baptist, if he was living in this time, I guarantee souls would be precious to him. He would be there for him. But can I tell you something? It should be concerning to us that we have neighbors and friends that don't know Christ but play the game of church, the game of religion. You know, Satan, he might not... Uh, he might not seem like he's very smart, very cunning, but, man, he got this religion game down. And he has people hook, line, and sinker. I like the fish. And, man, when, when you get, get somebody hooked, when you get a fish hooked and you know it's in, it's an exciting time. Satan's excited because there's a lot of religious people out there. Okay, we go down a little bit more and we, we look and, and, and we see this. We see that John the Baptist, just like Mark 6, 6, verses 8, it says, John the Baptist. Baptist was a man of God. He had a, man, a heart for God. And it says this in John uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 6 and 8. It says, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as a servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Can I tell you something? That verse right there, I underline in my Bible every time. And it says this, as a servant of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Can I tell you something? John the Baptist had a heart for God. That's why it didn't matter what, what he was thought of. It didn't matter the popularity. It didn't matter if he stepped on some toes. It didn't matter if people didn't like him because he wasn't in it to please man. Man, he had a heart for God. He wanted to please God. We look here and it says this, with, uh, with good will, will doing service as the Lord and not as men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord where where, wherever he be bond or free. You know what? There's no excuse not to, not to follow the Lord. There's no excuse to, to man please. Can I tell you something? Work is the hardest place for me. It's the hardest place for me. Because if, I, if I'm going to be honest, it's not where I want to be. Uh, when we're not in an environment that we want to be, we're already on a little bit of edge. And then you get in there and you're on edge and, and people get at you and, and, and I'm fleshly. I'm fleshly. Perry knows I'm fleshly. Uh, he's seen a side that you guys haven't seen. Uh, but can I be honest? Uh, if, we're, if we're being honest, our heart, if it's sincere, will keep us from being in a routine of that. Can I tell you, sinner, failed. Fail every day. Your pastor, sinner, fails. Doesn't mean it's an excuse to continue to fail. Can I tell you something else? We live in a society today that people have gotten a viewpoint of Christianity as we raise ourselves above other people, not that we're like them, sinners saved by grace. Hey, I'm, I'm a broken person. I'm a broken man. There are people that we work with that know that I'm a broken man. You know what? I need, I need God's grace every day. John needed God's grace every day. Our pastor needs God's grace every day. We in this country need to get back to wanting men to preach the Bible. We need to get back to standing behind men like our pastor that preaches the Bible. Can I tell you something? If a pastor is willing to preach the Bible and step on your toes, he's worth going to war for. Can I tell you this? Because he cares. He cares. Your pastor cares. John the Baptist cared for those people. That's why he didn't care if he was unpopular. Lastly, we'll just look at this. It says, John recognized who he was in the sight of God, verse 11. Verse 11. And it said this, I did baptize you with the water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Automatically elevates God, knows where God is compared to him. Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, who shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost with fire. Can I tell you, he elevated God, knew where he was. Can I tell you something else? When, when, we, uh, when we have the proper view of God, God, not only do we know where God is, we know exactly where we are with everybody else. I'm just like everybody else. I need grace just like everybody else. I need to treat people with grace like everybody else. I need mercy like everybody else. I need to treat people with mercy. You know what? The, the thing is, John the Baptist could preach all that stuff because he had time, but he had a heart for the Lord. He had a heart for the Lord's people. Can I tell you something? No matter what the bank account looks like, this is what matters right here. This is what matters. Souls are what matters. And you know what? I told my wife a long time ago when we set out for Bible college and I worked the night shifts and that stuff, I'd much rather be poor and be right with the Lord in Arkansas 
than be rich sitting up in Wisconsin and not doing the Lord's business, not doing what the Lord wants me to do. You know, I, I have I've seen God do ma- amazing things. But can I tell you, the most amazing thing is he saved a wretched sinner like myself, and he decided, hey, you're worth investing some time in and using you. God wants to save people, and he wants to use people. And, and with that being said, you know, John the Baptist, some cynics will say, well, John the Baptist was so great and so bold, they cut his head off. You know what? The greatest thing that John the Baptist gets to hear is, thou good and faithful servant. You know what? I hope to be able to hear, thou good and faithful servant. And, and you know what? I would love to be even thought of in the same conversation as John the Baptist in my lifetime. You know, uh, side note, uh, John the Tinkle was here, and, and there's a guy named Danny ba- uh, Billy Baker. And Billy Baker was at Bible Baptist Church for many, many, many years. He passed away this weekend. Can I tell you something? If you have the right view of God, the right view of God, you can touch any generation. That man, I look at, I look at him, and special guy, special saint, never had pride, always took care of people. He was able to reach people that were his age all the way down in their 20s. And it's just amazing if you just tap in or in tune with God, submit, submit yourself to, to the Lord, what he can do. That man was a sinner that was lost, and you know what? His, his grandson is now a, a pastor. You know, uh, generation after generation, but it started with one man getting in tuned. Maybe today you're, you're sitting here, I'm saved, and, and maybe, maybe I do not call to be a preacher, but how about just being a pillar in your family? Be a pillar in your family. Start something. You know, this legacy of, of being a Christian is not normal for the rest camps. My dad owns a shop. His language is not the best. I love him. Uh, Sarah's parents are Catholic. We're, we're oddballs. I'm oddball anyway, but we're more oddballs because of our beliefs. And, and can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? I'm praying that the next generation continues for the rest camp. Because there's a lot of them, a lot of them, that got some religion got on their high horse, and didn't follow this book. And I, unfortunately, I, I don't think that they're where I want them to be. So with that, I, I just encourage you, I encourage you, one, stick with the book. Stick in churches that preach the book. Stick behind that man here that preaches God's word. And it, 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 if anything, be a pillar in your family of what the God's word is. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, I just thank you for this time you've given to us, Lord. Lord, I just pray that we uh, can be a beacon of hope in this community, Lord. Lord, I just pray that we can shine your light on many people, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I I thank you for my salvation, Lord. Lord, I I just thank you for for just the assurance of knowing that I I can spend eternity with you, Lord. And Lord, I just pray. I pray that our church stays on fire for you, Lord. Stays on fire to stand behind a man of God like Pastor Brooks and never compromise. This, Lord. Lord, I just pray that we continue to do what's right and be the beacon, even when it's unpopular, Lord. I just pray that we continue to be true. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.